would like to introduce uh, Calvin Santiago from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He will be presenting today on cross-platform driving simulator scenarios to use in the roadway design and planning process. Um, we'd like to encourage you to use the chat function uh, to ask questions so that, because you're all muted, you can hear Kelvin clearly. Um, but please, anytime during your presentation, enter questions there. And then Calvin will be checking that space at a certain point during his presentation to uh, sort of address some of your questions and, and talk about the things you're interested in. So, Calvin, take it away. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, just to make sure, can everybody hear me? Don, are we clear on your side? Yes, we are. I can hear you well. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, thank you everyone for taking the time to attend this webinar. Um, as we've done for Safer Sim, we've done some good projects that have resulted in some uh, findings, but uh, sometimes some of the stuff that gets done as part of the project is actually even more interesting than the findings themselves. And I know that as we go to meetings and conferences, there are always questions about how how hard is to create scenarios from scratch and how can you make them compatible with other platforms. So today we just wanted to share just a little bit of the stuff that we've experienced over the, over the past few years and how can that benefit some people in creating uh, scenarios that are not daunting to, to everyone. And the idea behind this is that what we see is that when a project gets started, um, it's usually assigned to, let's say, a student, and that student is a recent, a recent engineering graduate, and they have certain skills, but on the other hand, the process of creating scenarios takes a different set of skills. And what we found is that that part of the process uh, takes time. Learning how to create scenarios takes time, so we kind of and working on making those things uh, uh, up streamlining that process, okay? And today I want to talk to you about some of that process, okay? So what we're going to be discussing today is basically, I'm just going to give you an overview, basically that idea, expand a little bit what you just mentioned, streamlining the process. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's behind a 3D model, and I'm going to try to explain it in, in terms that are understandable for someone that doesn't have any knowledge about uh, art or 3D modeling as a profession, which is someone, again, that just graduated from school and is pursuing a graduate career in research and needs to create simulator scenarios. Uh, we're going to talk about how do we go from a format that can be used by, uh, let's say, medicine to a format that can be used by RTI. And when I say format, I talk about the 3D model. There are certain steps that still need to be created, st still need to be taken in platform in a platform that you're using. But a lot of the the heavy lifting can be done outside of the platform, and you don't need to uh, be proficient in like complex modeling tools. Okay. Then I'm going to talk about how we're going to use certain tools that are available to engineers to create roadway designs, and how we're going to use that in a simple way to start creating the foundations for a scenario. Finally, I'm going to talk about um, some scripts that we have developed that allow simplifying the texturing process of scenarios, which is sometimes one of the most difficult things to do or that people have problems understanding. So I'm going to talk about how we can simplify that process. And finally, how can we simplify the process of generating roadway metadata. That is data that is used to support um, driving on the actual scenario. Okay, so let's get things started a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about what happens in a traditional scenario. Number one, you probably have an experiment in mind. Okay, let's say you have an experiment that the user has to go to a particular section, let's call it, let's call it the warm-up section, then it goes to an area in which we're collecting data or a day, an area in which that data is actually of interest. Then we get out of that area, move to another one in which we need to collect data, 
move away from that one, go to another one, and finally finish the experiment. So one of the things that actually happens is that when you start looking at your experiment, only very limited areas of it actually require a lot of 3D modeling. And perhaps some of those styles are actually already available to you as part of the of the tools that you have in your driving simulator. However, sometimes we need to connect things, and when we connect those things, we probably want them to have a little bit more of a realistic geometry uh, to represent um, a particular roadway characteristic, perhaps something that we see outside whenever we drive, okay? These areas in here, these warm-up areas that connect the parts of the experiments is what we're focusing on. It's like how do we create specific geometries, specific transitions that can be pretty much created automatically or with little effort and without little knowledge. Okay, so whenever we try to teach someone how to create a scenario, the first thing that happens is they open um, a 3D model into, let's say, Blender in our case. And if you ever open that software, it can be daunting at the beginning. It's just scary, I don't blame you. It has so many options and in reality we don't even use 99.9% .9 of them, okay? But it's a professional software and it's made for that. So kind of what we ask ourselves is like, do we really need to use this? How do we, how do we, how do, we do it automatically? How do we get rid of as much of the treated model process? How do we get it out of the out of the way, how do we get most of it out of the way? Okay, now, if we're gonna get that out of the way, the first thing I wanna do is explain what's behind that. So in this interface that you see on the screen, yeah, I know it's scary, it has a lot of options, but what's behind that? What we really care is what's inside in here. We care about what the model is in particular. It's like, what's that model? Is it really complex or is it a simple one? Well, let's dive a little bit into that, okay? And what I want to do is actually show you a 3D model, okay? And we're all familiar with those tiles that come with the simulator, okay? And what I want to do is dissect the content of a tile in terms that it can be understood without the use of 3D modeling software. Okay, and what we see on the screen here is a screenshot from my um, scenario sampling tool, uh, Internet Scene Assembler in our case. And what we see on the other side of the screen in here is just the same um, roadway segment on on a 3D modeling software. So what you're seeing here is actually the model. I can make changes here. I can edit polygons, all that stuff. Okay, now what's really behind it? Okay, let's actually think about it. So I highlighted a particular portion of the model in here, okay? And that particular portion represents basically the curve, the gutter, the shoulder, and the roadway surface, okay? Now, if we start looking at what's really going on in here, we see that there are vertices highlighted here on the screen, a bunch of vertices, and then you have lines that connect with other vertices ahead, okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about what's, how is that really defined. So when we talk about 3D file, sometimes we don't think about it like a file is nothing more than a set of instructions for a computer to do something. It is the same case in a 3D model. Like, in the case of the tiles that I use, I create them in OBJ format, okay? So if you see any OBJ file out there on the wild, it contains instructions on how to display a model. And if we understand what's inside it, then we realize that it's a very, very simple file and that we shouldn't be scared about the interface that is used to create it, okay? Let's actually talk about that file. Okay, so in here on the screen, 
what I have. It's basically uh, a tile, a sample tile that I slice. And I'm showing you the start and the end of the tile. Because this is a sample tile, as a simple, it's a very simple tile. It's basically flat, okay? So just to explain, and I pick a, a flat tile, a flat roll weight segment that contains, as you see in here, your curve and gutter, your curve and gutter here, your shoulder, and finally, your roadway surface in here, okay? And remember those vertices that I mentioned in the previous slide? One is here, another here, another here, another here, another here, another here, another here, here, another here, here and here, okay? So right there, this entire model, when you think about it, don't think about the, the interface of the 3D model and software, think about what defines it, okay? If you're going to define this in mathematical terms, something that most graduates are very good at, it's like you just need a couple of points. Well, not a couple, one, two, three, four, five, ten, so 18 points. 18 points is all you need to define this 3D model. You can even do this in Notepad if you want to create this, this 3D model, so you don't really need any, any specialized software for this, okay? But let's talk a little bit more, okay? So this OBJ file that I mentioned, again, is nothing more than a set of instructions for the computer, okay? So if we take this OBJ file, this OBJ file, we can open it in something like a text editor. In my case, I use Notepad++ to look at it. You can use Notepad, you can use whatever text editor you want. And what we need to do is actually look inside this file and start thinking about what the content is. Okay, so in here, all these vertices that you see that I highlighted on the screen, they have a particular ID assigned to it, okay? This vertex, vertex here is number one. This one here at the end is number two. This one number three. This one number four, okay? On purpose, they actually don't follow a particular pattern. We'll sort them later, but Let's just assume that each vertex, or each vertex of the of the model has a particular ID. What does that ID correspond to? Okay, let's actually look at this. See in here, one, two, three, four. That's actually what it corresponds to. The vertex ID on a file that defines a 3D model as an OBJ is nothing more than the line number that represents the points, okay? So if we want to see what are the actual coordinates of this vertex in here of number two, we just go to line two and see that, hey, 112.285, 201.17, and 0 0.100. Now, for now, I'm going to say that this is the x-coordinate, this is the y, and this is the c, okay? For now, just for now, I'm working on a coordinate system that is x, y, and c. The reason I'm saying for now is because that's not actually how we export the model, but I know a lot of people are trained in this particular um, coordinate order, okay? So that's why I wanted to mention it in these terms, okay? Let me clean up the screen a little bit more here. Hey, Kelvin, while you're cleaning up the oh. screen, um, there's been a comment yeah. that we can't see your mouse pointer, for example, when you're saying here, here, and here. So maybe if you make a little oh. dot with your drawing tool so people can see where you're pointing, that'd be great. Can you guys see when I write? Yes, we can see when you write, just not when you point. Okay. Great. Okay, I'll just keep using the, the pen for this. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, like I was saying, so this vertex ID has coordinates associated with this, which is basically the line number on the file. And I should say that when I say line number, it is in a very sim simple way, we're gonna assume that the line number resets whenever we see something like V, okay, in this case. 
because there could be multiple objects in a file, but I'm not gonna, I'm not going to get there for now. I'm just telling you that the first the the line number for two in this case is two. If this was a lot lower on the text file, then this would be one or three or ten. But it's just continuous, okay? So that's the line number for two. If this is two, then the line the information for vertex four is actually here. And that's actually like another set of coordinates. Okay? So why is that important? Well, the reason that is important is because that's what the computer sees. Okay? So notice that I've highlighted in here four vertices. One, two, three, and four. Okay? And let's just imagine that here on the screen, all this is filled with the 3D model. I just show you the start and the end. So start here and here. Just imagine that in between is filled with lines and textures. Okay? So notice that when it says B, that corresponds to a vertex that defines geometry. So we know that the geometry is defined then from this point to this particular point. Okay? So again, a 3D model is nothing more than a collection of points. What do we see next in the file? Okay? We see something that is an F in here. What does F stand for? It stands for a face. Okay? So until now, I'm just talking about a collection of points. But notice that when you see vertex 1 and when you see vertex 2, vertex 3, and vertex 4, those seem to be, those seem to represent the top of the curve in the model. So it's, again, you see 1, 3, 2, and 4, those represent the points that define the top of the curve. No wonder that then we say, hey, this model contains a face that is defined by 2, 1, 3, and 4. So when the computer processes files, it goes through all the points, it loads all the points into memories, then it says F, and it goes like, hey, there's a face. Okay, which one, what, what is defined in this face? Well, it's the connection of points 2, 1, 3, and 4. Then it says, oh, there's another face, it's 6, 8, 7, 5. And you can start making connections between here. It's like 6, uh, 6, 8, 7, 5. So there's a face connecting 6, 8, 7, 5. Okay? The same way that there's a face connecting 1, 3, 4, and 2. Okay? So on a simplest term, What's inside an OBJ file is nothing more than a collection of points with certain faces specified. Now, what is that particular order of the faces? I'm showing so far the model here texture, but I haven't specified any texture information here. I just, I'll get into that soon. But what I'd like to point out now is the order that is showing here. So see two, one, three, and four. Let's look at it again. Two, one, three, and four. Notice something in here? It is defined counterclockwise. Let's look at another one. Six, eight, seven, five. Six, eight, seven, five. Again, counterclockwise. So that is important because remember that right hand rule that pretty much everyone learning college, in which your thumb indicates the direction based on how you rotate your hand. When you define something counterclockwise, that means that something called the normals of the face actually go in the direction of your thumb. When you define something clockwise, then that normal goes in the direction of your thumb, which is down in the, in the right-hand rule. Okay, so counterclockwise, 
the normal goes in what we call positive C uh, clockwise, the normal goes in what we call negative C, okay? And C as in zebra, okay? So that right-hand rule is kind of important to understand what's the normal. And what the normal is important for is because it defines what the user sees. So in the case of our simulator, if the normal is pointing in the wrong direction, the texture will not be visible, okay? So for the textures to be visible, the normals of the faces, which are defined by either counterclockwise or clockwise, they need to be pointing in the direction that the user can see the normal, okay? That's the simple rule. If the user can see the normal, then the user can see the properly textured model, okay? Now, again, we're talking only about a model without textures that is defined by something like this, just a collection of points and a specific, uh, specific faces values. And now, I said that I haven't talked about textures. I'm actually going to do that right now. So I have a particular model in here defined by vertices. And now you actually say texture again. It's been textured all the time. But let's actually talk about how we, how we put that texture into the model, okay? For that, we need to talk about something that we all know, our x and y axis, okay? So those Cartesian coordinates are gonna become important now, okay? But before we move ahead, I want you to think about what's actually happening in here. So see in here that the cross section of this road goes something like this, right? Goes something like this, right? We need to actually be aware of what is this entire sum, okay? So this is a length, this is a length, this is a length. We need to be able to know what is the entire length of this, of that cross section, okay? And that's just nothing more than adding the numbers, you know? If a curve is six inches, then you know it starts six inches, and then the shoulder eight feet, the gutter 12 inches. You can add up those values. You just need to be aware of what that is, okay? Now, how do we use that? Well, see that I have the 3D model in, in here, and I also have something here that is called my UV coordinate system, okay? And the UV coordinate system has one important characteristic, and that is that everything is in relative values on the x-axis from zero to one, okay? That's what we need to know about this UV system. Now, the reason that's important is because, well, we can fire up a program. Let's say if you wanna be really, really simple, you can fire up Paint, Microsoft Paint, and start creating a texture in it, something like this, an image that represents a, a road from the top view, and you create that image, okay? And then you say, okay, my image, we're gonna assume that regardless of the size, it's gonna measure one unit, okay? It's gonna be from zero, from zero here, to one in here, okay? And those are gonna be my X coordinates. What happens is that, well, if we actually know the length of an element, let's say the gutter in here, we know where the gutter starts and where the gutter ends. We know the length here, and we also know the total cumulative length that happened between the curve, the drop, and the gutter, okay? Because we have that length, the cumulative length at this point, we know we now divide that length by the total length of your model, and that gives you the UV coordinate for this particular point. We'll repeat the process here. It gives us the UV coordinate for this particular point, okay? So 
So that's what a UV coordinate is, and I'm going to show it. I'm going to show it to you apply in the next in the next slide. Okay. Again, if we continue our convention, we know that the start has a UV coordinate of zero, and the end has a UV coordinate of 1.0. Okay. And if we do the computations in the particular model that I'm showing you, the start of the driving surface in here, the road, it's 0 .0, 0 0.083, while the end of the other lanes is 0 0.694. Okay? Now, just like before, remember that the geometry is defined as with a V, and then we have the coordinates after that. The UV coordinates that specify how a texture is applied to my model are actually specified simply by X and Y. Okay? Notice that I start in here, I say, okay, I have a point that's a UV point that's going to define my texture, 0 0.983, that's the X coordinate, and 17.5. I'll get to the 17.5 later. but Let's talk about what's actually going on in here. Similar to what we had before in our previous in the previous file that I showed you, we had F specifying a face, and then F had particular points that defined that face. Those were the first points. Now, what we're actually doing in here is that after that face, we're going to add a slash. And we're going to specify the cord, the point that defines the texture. So we know that this face, let's say uh, the face that goes from 0 0.083, which is here, to uh, what's the next one? 0 0.0175, it's around here. Um, and then we have 0 0.694, which is here. So this face that we see on the screen here, and I actually have a better version to show you like this. That face that now you see on the screen highlighted is basically defined by four coordinates, not for point, not for geometry this time, but for texture. What that means is that the computer sees and says, okay, this point to so this point, attach it here, and this point, attach it here. Okay? So it knows that, okay, I'm going to apply that texture at that particular point. But then, remember that 17.5 that I mentioned here? So that 17.5 is nothing more than, well, let's see, I know the length of my road, my roadway, or my tile length here, okay? So I know that length. Then I actually know when I created the texture, what is the actual real world length of this texture? Let's say it's 40 in my case in here. Because it's 40, this Y coordinate in here is defined as L divided by 40, okay? So that's what's actually going on. So when you see this coordinate here, all it sounds like, okay, at this point, attach this point. At that point at the end, attach a point that you cannot see on the screen, okay? So at this point, attach something that you cannot see on the screen. It's somewhere up there, okay? So, so I'm going to keep going here. So, so far, what we talk about is that we've been talking about an OBJ file, and we've been talking about the content of that OBJ file, okay? Now, that OBJ file, I know I talk about the texture, what the points that define textures, the points that define geometry. Well, all that actually goes in one file alone. It doesn't, it doesn't require multiple files. And... When I was talking about lines, I was talking about 
the relative position of a line. I was saying like, oh, it's going to be line one corresponds to the first ID and so on. The reason I was talking about that is because in the file, you're going to have a collection of uh, vertices that are basically put together, one next to the other. Then this becomes vertex one. This becomes vertex two. You see that consecutively, the vertex ID keeps increasing. Then you're going to see a collection of points that are texture points, okay, or, or vertices for textures. And then this is going to become point one, this point two, and this point three. And that's why I was saying, okay, regardless of the line number, it's just a relative position of what matters. Okay? Now, so far we talk about this vertices that define geometry, and we talk about the points that define the texturing. But we haven't really talked about what texture goes there, what texture is applied. Well, what's really going on in here is that you have the point, you have the vertices that define geometry, the vertices that define texture. Then you also have here these lines that define how the faces are formed based on these vertices. There's something else missing here, and that is this particular line of code or this particular statement. What it says, use MTL. Okay, it says use MTL. Okay, and it's like okay, use material. Okay, so a texture in the model is defined as a material. Okay, so we certainly find that for this particular object that is defined in the OBJ file, we seem to be calling it. We're calling it to use. We're asking it to use. Mat road direct there's one point zero zero one so it's a name okay a name that I should have cleaned I forgot to clean and make it more real but what's important in here is not that name but the fact that that particular name is actually found inside another file okay so we have the OBJ file which defines the geometry. And now we have another file, which is an MTL file that defines the materials, okay? And those materials are defined, or the location of those materials is specified at the top of the file, which we say MTL lib, and then we say, okay, look for this particular file, okay? So we have our base file, and then our base file indicates that we should be pointing to a particular material, okay? And what's going on here is that if we go inside this particular material, it's actually defined in here. And I'm not going to get into the details of uh, ambient lighting and specular specularity, any of that. I'm just going to get going in here. What's, what's important to say about this file is that this file in here, see that mat row directory matches in here, and then we see at the bottom we have the name of the texture that we're applying. Okay? So a Trinity model is nothing more than a collection on its essence. I want to oversimplify things, but on its essence, it's nothing more than a collection of a file that defines the geometry, that is the OBJ file, a file that defines materials, that is the MTL file, and the corresponding texture for those materials, okay? On its essence, that is the bare bones of a 3D model that contains a texture, okay? Now, if you're wondering what this is about here, it's just a name. So when you say, okay, I'm going to start defining an object, here's the name that I'm going to assign to it. That's all that matters in there. Okay. Um, now, this is an OBJ file, okay? And it's a very standard file that is can be used by pretty much every 3D model and software out there. If you're going to be using this file in something like a 
administer. Uh, you have to take it through a particular process in order to turn it into a tile. If you want to put it into something like RTI, you have to take it to a particular process to turn it into another tile. Okay, so two paths in here, things diverge a little bit in here, but the geometry that is specified in the OBJ file can be the same. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in here is all the RTI conversion process. Okay, the RTI conversion process is actually uh, quite straightforward. Okay, and my favorite thing about this process is that pretty much we can use free tools, okay? And the reason that I say we can use free tools is because, well, you can have this installed on any computer, use them for free, and you don't run into any licensing issues, you don't need keys for the software, none of, the, none of that stuff, okay? The first tool that I like to use is MeshLab, okay? It's available for free, Google MeshLab download, it's going to be there, okay? And remember this OBJ file that we just discussed? Well, what we're going to do is, under MeshLab, we're going to actually say, okay, file, import mesh, and we're going to select our object, okay? That's it, first step. Then, what's actually going to happen is that we're going to Basically, okay, once we have it loaded, we go to File, we select Export Mesh now. That's all. We're just going to open and export. When we export, here's when it becomes important, okay? And we're going to export, and we're going to select Export, the Export option where it says File Types. We're going to select Vermo File Format because uh, RTI platform, yes, it can use flight format, but mostly it relies on vermal files. Okay, so we have that, and when we come to this stage, all we have to do is say, hey, all we care about in here is that we keep the texture coordinates, the images, if everything was done properly, are going to show up in here. We have that file. And then we just hit OK, and we get a, a vermal file format. Okay? Now, um, the vermal file format, it looks a little bit more complex than an OBJ file format, which is the one that I show you how to create by hand. But it's actually about the same thing, just as a different structure. Okay? Um, this is the structure on the left side of the screen. On the, of the screen. That's like the overall structure of a vermal file format. Again, it looks more complex than an OBJ file format, but it's when you start looking at it, it's actually not that complicated. The important thing to note is that ignore everything you know, everything in here, just you can forget about it for now. Just look at we have a collection of points and we have a collection of texture coordinates, those UV points. Then we have a specification of how to form faces and specifications of how to form textures. So it's all the same at the end. It's just in a different in a different format. Okay. The simplicity of the file that you see here on the OBJ file, again you see like coordinates that we're familiar with, with it's a coordinate that defines a geometry. You see, if you actually look closely, you can find those coordinates again in the Burma file format. Again, it's nothing more than a collection of points at the end. Every file format out there, well, not every, most of the file formats out there are just simply a collection of points. Okay? And Burma and OBJ, which are very used uh, for simulators, are just that. Okay? So that's it. Now, that file that we create when using MeshLab, uh, there's one little trick. Technically, you can just drop that into your authoring tool. You can put that into ISA, and it should work just fine. However, there are a few limitations of doing that. One is that it doesn't expose some of the texture information that is there. Okay? So, 
there's something built in into the the tools that RTI provides with their simulator, and that is a little program that is called Vermal Convert .exe. Okay, that Vermal Convert .exe is basically a program that accepts the Vermal file that is created by converting the OBJ into Vermal. It takes that, it asks you for where do you want to save it, so you just assign a name to it, and how do you want to save it, and then you just assign another name to it, okay? This could be like destination.vr or .vrl, an object name doesn't need an extension, it's just an object name for the program to recognize, okay? Now, what happens in there is just a few tweaks to the file. It's nothing more, the structure remains the same, but what happens there is that the textures are exposed so that ISA can actually look at the textures and you can change the textures um, within ISA. However, this is something that happens when you go through the export process. If you actually open the resulting file, the converted file in Vermal, um, just make sure that a line that refers to URL, URL and specify the location of the texture. Just make sure at least my preference is to keep that as a relative path as opposed to keeping it as a full path. If you want to use a full path, that's fine, but then you have to move textures to the correct location in your computer. Um, I prefer to just keep everything relative. Just a personal preference. Uh, not that it changes anything here. But again, the file format it just makes it uh, easier to understand by ISA. That's all that really happens in there. Okay. Now, I know that I talk about like how to do this by hand and how to create a file by hand. That is just a simple file, uh, a straight road, and I show you the definition of those files, but Sometimes that's a little bit unrealistic, okay? So we can always rely, rely on that. So what I'm gonna show you next is how do we create um, the roadway of a tile um, using um, engineering design tools in a very simple way. I'm just gonna give you a very, very uh, simplistic overview of the process, but it's actually a useful one, okay? Now. First thing, I know that we're talking about something that can be shared across platform. Uh, so RTI doesn't really care about what the size of your tile is. However, uh, Minisim does care, okay? Because Minisim cares, RTI doesn't care. My recommendation is that when you're creating scenarios, um, you create tiles that are a multiple of 660 feet, okay? So 660 feet. Just keep that in mind. So what I like to do is, in my cat tool, I like to create a square that is 660 by 660, and then I find the midpoint of the square on one side, the midpoint of the square on the other side, and then I kind of outline a road in, in my cat program, okay? Now, um, when I create the roads, one thing that you can do is forget about all the complexities about civil 3D in my case, which is what I like to use. Um, just focus on the road itself, okay? Now, the reason I say that is because civil 3D can get very complex very fast, but anyone can draw a line in a center, in a center line, okay? Like shown here, like a line, curves, line and curve, line and curve, anyone can do that. So there's not all complexity in there. So I do that. I draw a line that represents my alignment. The tools are out there. It's just one of the simplest tools to use in the program. If you're actually wondering, it's under alignment, alignment creation tools, that's it, okay? And you can see here that we're actually working with engineering precision um, 
when creating curves, and we can modify the parameters of these curves, check it against the sign standards, all that stuff. We're not going to get into that. Okay? But we have the alignment. We have the center line of the roadway or the edge of a roadway, which is what I like to do. We have that, but that basically makes the road flat. Okay? So we know that we have the horizontal um, geometry of the curve of the road. Now we need the vertical geometry of the, of the curve. For that, we need to actually go ahead and do that. Um, it's quite simple. Um, we just create a vertical, the vertical geometry. And what you can see in here is that, okay, the, line, the horizontal starts here, and so on we have a vertical curve in here, okay? And those, again, you can specify the engineering characteristics of that vertical curve, change points, play with the alignment, um, all that stuff that is part of a highway design course. But those values can be changed easily. The next thing I like to do, and this is why I say forget about the complexities of civil 3D, is like I like to pick a very, very standard highway cross section. And I tell the, the program, I tell civil 3D, like, okay, I gave you already the horizontal alignment. Now I'm giving you the vertical alignment. I'm going to give you a sample cross section, and I'm going to ask you to extrude that cross-section and create what is called a corridor, okay? Once I do that, and again, I don't care too much about the characteristics of this corridor. All I really care about is that now I have a corridor, okay? So my line, my center, my center line or my edge line, it's actually at the middle and has been created and has been turned into a nice row. Okay? You see that the curve that I have in here is actually the same in in this area in here. So it all looks uh, engineering great. Okay? I do that. And again, I don't care too much about everything else. What I care about is that now I can go ahead and say, hey, let's actually extract a 3D polyline from this roadway. And I'm going to extract that line now. So that line that I define horizontally, and then I say, well, with the vertical characteristics, now I can actually extract by going and saying, hey, give me the polyline from the corridor in here, from that menu that appears whenever you're working on a corridor. And I can say, give me the crown line. I say, okay. The next thing that happens is that suddenly I have a line on my screen. Okay? I have that line on my screen. It's a 3D line, contains X, Y, and Z. Okay? I can change values there. I can make it denser. I recommend you do that. In my case, I like to deal with uh, sample, sampling points every 50 feet for tangents and 5 feet for curves. Okay? Vertical and horizontally. Then, what I do is I take that line that appear here, I just move to a different cat enter to a different window in cat, copy that line. Then what I like to do is actually offset that line to my desired geometry and I could offset it in this direction too if I wanted to. So I offset that line and now I have two lines that are particularly offset at a particular width. And then using another program that is also free, it's called Cat Tools, and you can Google that Cat Tools, C A D tools. Uh, get that, like I said, offset through the polar line, uh, clean that line, make sure that there are no doubles, duplicates using the overkill command, and finally, using the same program, I take that line, again, I select the line, and I extract it into a CSV file. So that CSV file will contain the X, the Y, and the C of every line. Okay, so that's kind of the, the bird's eye view of how things can be done in CAD. It all starts with just a few, a few lines that get assigned 3D characteristics, and then we extract the 3D characteristics into a CSV file. Okay, then 
we go a little bit into the uh, some tools that we created as part of this project to automate the text room process. Okay, and what happens here is that okay, so I know I've been talking about lines, but what do lines represent? Well, these three lines represent the edge of a roadway, something like this, from here to here. So two lines can define an entire roadway. One line here and one line in here defines this direction of travel. One line in here, another line in here define this direction of travel. Okay? So those are different surface objects. Okay? So we create those lines in CAD and we extract its characteristics. So we got like the X, Y, and C. We get that in a CSV file. And so we have a CSV file for this line, a CSV file for this one, a CSV file for this, and another one for this in this case. Okay? Something like that. Okay? Then, what actually happens is that we created uh, a script that basically allows allows you to go and say, okay, I have uh, seven or let's say three CSV files. Okay? And I'm going to put those files through a script because these files represent uh, a road. Okay? They represent a road. I put those three, three CSV files. I say, okay, these are my three CSV files. I also have a particular texture that I want to apply. I have that particular texture, and I put them through a script, and a 3D model comes out. So what, is, what does it need? It needs the files. It needs, it, it needs the, basically, it needs the files that you have here. It needs the texture that you have here. And it needs uh, information about the texture, okay? Now, the reason it needs information about the texture is because to avoid making assumptions. Uh, so in here, you can say, okay, this is my texture, and I know that between this line and this line, I'm going to grab this particular portion of the texture, so perhaps from 0 0.083 to 0 0.694. So from 0 0.083 to 0.694. So this is the value that goes there, 0 0.083, and here, 0 0.694. And if you have multiple segments, like segment one, segment two, segment three, you do the same thing across the way, okay? We do that, and basically, a 3D model comes out. Um, I should be clear, uh, terrain is not generated, in this case that I'm showing you here, uh, just to be completely clear. The reason I don't generate terrain is because it can be, uh, it's something that you can do very easily in a 3D model software. But all this that you see in here is an example of a road that was defined and automatically textured using the program. Okay? The other script that we created is that, well, we know the lines that define the roadway surface. The roadway surface is defined by this line and this line in here. We pass those, that, those lines to a program. What happens is that we get a file that defines the correlated data for the roadway. So we turn that into an actual simulator, simulator roadway. In the case of uh, RTI, we create what is called a spline. In the case of uh, the, the medicine platform, we create what is called a path file. Okay? And yes, RTI can take path files for a conversion process, but just two different things to make it simpler. Okay? Uh, so that's basically a summary of the process that that we have assembled. And what I really wanted to do today is just give you an idea of what's the underlying theory and how simple it is to, how simple uh, files can be, like creating files from scratch. Um, the texturing process, what the program does is that it kind of, kind of automatically looks at each face and decides what coordinates to apply for the texture so that you get transitions that are nice and curves and all that. So that's where the, the meat of the program is. It's just taking care of that texturing process. But at the end, it's just generating a simple text file that defines the instructions for the computer. OK? Uh, for the path file in, uh, in Minisim, all we're doing is 
if we have this line that defines the roadway surface, this other line that defines the other edge of the roadway surface, we're actually computing the vector normals because that's actually what makes a path file, okay? Normals and points, okay? So that basically summarizes the process. Um, I know we started a little bit late, so I kind of sped things up a little bit to try to stay in time. Uh, if there are any particular questions, uh, I will answer them now. Um, I assume that you guys can hear me, so I'm going to answer the question. What percentage of a drive can be done with a pre-existing database? Um, uh, let's see if I'm understanding this correctly. Uh, the percentage will depend on in in our okay that clarifies the question so in our case uh we just did an entire experiment and we actually used the, just this process we didn't we didn't use any pre-existing tiles but that's because we were looking at geometry on the road so we created about 10 miles of roadway using this process and displayed like uh, holographic signs on the simulator so that basically made it uh, if uh, the full experiment was created that way. Now, in other ones, we're actually planning an experiment for later in the summer that will include some intersections. So in terms of mileage, it's a high percentage. Uh, I would say about 90. But then uh, some of the complexity is actually in the, in the intersection itself. Thank you, everyone, for attending, if you can still hear me. Um, we, uh, we will post a recording of this presentation on the Saferson YouTube channel. And thank you very much.